Item number, SCP-025. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. SCP-025 is only to be opened during testing, as is the room in which SCP-025 is stored. Entry codes are to be given only to authorized research and security personnel. No other containment protocols required. Description. SCP-025 is a wooden wardrobe, measuring 0.97 meters by 0.62 meters by 1.95 meters, full of clothing dating from a number of time periods. Articles contained within the chest, collectively named SCP-025-1, match with styles of decades from the 1920s to the present. The apparel from each time frame varies with regard to style. For example, a polyester striped shirt and a pair of charcoal suit pants both correspond with general styles of the 1970s. The only unifying aspect of every article contained in SCP-025 is that each one is in poor condition. Moths have eaten up much of the collection, and tears and runs are not uncommon. When any item from SCP-025 is put on, the wearer is observed to either to die or suffer an injury within 24 hours. The cause of death or injury in these instances is invariably linked to the aforementioned flaws in the clothing, but only ever appears to be an unrelated incident. Wearing a glove with a fingertip cut off may result in the loss of the fingertip through a simple kitchen accident like chopping onions. Similarly, a subject wearing a poncho with a sleeve missing will somehow cause the loss of the uncovered arm, be it an attack by a wild animal or a vehicular accident that necessitates the amputation of the limb. If placed in a sealed, unfurnished enclosure while wearing an item from the chest, the wearer will either seemingly spontaneously contract a flesh-eating disease that begins in the areas not covered by the clothing, or suffer the failure of an organ located beneath an imperfection in the article. Diseases arising from such incidents may or may not be contagious. No study has been successfully undertaken due to the speed at which the strains observed run their course. Recommended that, if possible, samples of the disease be taken to lab for possible weaponization. Following is an abridged testing log of SCP-025. More thorough testing will accompany the declassification of the document in its entirety. Test Log SCP-025 Section 1 Subject D-778 A 42-year-old white male Article 1940s-era white tuxedo Imperfections Torn seam in left shoulder. Test results. Subject was allowed free roam of the halls, under agent supervision. For approximately 45 minutes, nothing eventful occurred. However, at security tapes and eyewitnesses indicate that D-778 appeared to make an attempt at attacking agent He in turn overcame the subject with a knife, causing an inch-deep gash in D-778's left shoulder precisely at the point where the tuxedo's seam was ripped. Test halted. Subject later terminated. Subject, D-690, a 26-year-old white male. Article, 2004 Boston Red Sox baseball cap. Imperfections. Missing size adjuster in back of cap. Logo in front partially removed. Test results. Placed in a sealed room with the subject was a table on which were a loaded Jericho Baby Eagle 9mm handgun a grill lighter, and a hatchet. D-690 chose to wear the cap backward for the test. Potential effects of this decision on the outcome of the test are unknown. Subject expressed reluctance to touch any of the objects on the table for several hours. Food and water were provided as necessary. After four hours of general inactivity, subject picked up the handgun and examined it. While holding it at roughly eye level, the weapon discharged into D-690's forehead, where the size adjustment band would have been. The round exited the subject near the part of the hat with the missing part of the logo. Subjects D-736, a 22-year-old white male D-771, a 23-year-old white male Article Burgundy striped sweater vest, dating from 1973 Imperfections Articles seem to have been partially eaten by moths, several large holes in the front of the sweater. Test Results D-736 was asked by researching staff to wear the sweater vest, which he did under duress. D-771 was given a loaded handgun out of sight of the other test participant and instructed to, on a given signal, fire all six shots in the direction of D-736. After doing so, 
It was noted that every shot fired passed through one of the holes in the sweater vest, leaving the clothing intact and killing D-736. Firearm retrieved, surviving subject transported back to quarters. Subject, D-771, a 23-year-old white male. Article, sweater vest from above trial. Imperfections, same as mentioned. Test results, D-771 was this time placed in an empty room, dimensions 15 meters by 15 meters by 15 meters. Only objects in the enclosure were lights overhead. Subject initially complained of boredom, then lay on his back and went to sleep. After two hours and 14 minutes, two of the fluorescent light bulbs in the ceiling suddenly dislodged and fell. Both landed squarely on holes in the sweater, shattering upon impact. One of the tubes broke into jagged pieces that impaled D-771 in several areas, but only again through gaps already present in the sweater vest. Subject's vitals persisted for another six minutes, then ceased. Further testing locations will be selected to minimize possible damage to the surrounding area. Subject, Dr. B Unplanned experiment. An unidentified individual left an article from SCP-025 on Dr. B's desk that looked similar to an item of his own clothing. Any information about this incident and or the perpetrator of same should be reported immediately to senior staff. Article, lightweight scarf, dyed a number of colors. Imperfections. Heavily pulled seam caused scarf to be considerably shorter and tighter in the middle. Test results. According to his itinerary, Dr. B wearing the item from SCP-025, was en route to the enclosure of SCP- on B for routine testing. However, he diverged from his intended path and began in a direction towards an entirely separate wing of the facility. Subject then entered the enclosure of SCP-173 without gathering accompaniment or following safety protocols, and, upon hearing the door closing, blinked. Cause of death listed as strangulation, resulting from a crushed windpipe. Subject, D-802, a 30-year-old Hispanic female. Article, 1980s flash dance style white shirt. Imperfections, right shoulder removed, left sleeve completely cut off. Entire bottom hem shredded. Test results. Data expunged. All present were presumed infected, then quarantined and data expunged. All further tests involving 1980s era fashion have been postponed indefinitely, due to the expenditures and safety hazards presented by the aforementioned experiment. Full cleanup estimated to take an additional weeks. Further testing authorized. Results now awaiting declassification. Item Number SCP-086 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-086 is contained within Office A-19 at Bioresearch Station 71. The secretarial post outside the door is to be staffed by one armed guard. All components of SCP-086 are to be kept within six meters of each other. SCP-086-1 is to be kept on the office desk with a single connection to the telephone at the secretary's post. All communications between SCP-086 and personnel are to be recorded, transcribed, and archived. Every six days, SCP-086-2 is to be used to sharpen four standard commercially purchased 16cm HB pencils, continuing until at least 95% of the mass of each pencil has been converted into pencil shavings. SCP-086-2 is not to be emptied even if personnel judge that it has become clogged. In such an eventuality, personnel are to wait 10 minutes and then resume sharpening. Every seven days, SCP-086-3 is to be filled with a block of 200 standard commercially purchased staples. Every 20 days, SCP-086-4 is to be filled with 15 sheets of standard commercially purchased microfilm blank cellulose acetate film produced on site. SCP-086-5 is to be drained of waste matter whenever it fills more than halfway. The waste matter is to be incinerated. All reading material requested by SCP-086 must be approved by Site Command. All research proposals made by SCP-086 must be approved by 205 level personnel. Description SCP-086 is a collective sessile organism 
whose component parts resemble items of office equipment from 1978, and which contains a consciousness claiming to be that of former Foundation Administrator Dr. 1907-1978. Its eight components are a rotary telephone, SCP-0861, a wall-mounted pencil sharpener, SCP-0862, a desk stapler, SCP-0863, a microfiche reader, SCP-0864, a water cooler, SCP-0865, a filing cabinet, SCP-0866, a scientific calculator, SCP-0867, and a slide rule, SCP-0868. No physical connection or electromagnetic transmission between any of these components has been detected. Each component of SCP-086 is composed of biological material, contained within a carapace made of varying amounts of chitin, keratin, and calcium carbonate, as well as trace amounts of nylon, rayon, and polyester. DNA analysis reveals that the tissues contained within SCP-086 are partially of human origin and data expunged. SCP-0861 contains a large mass of neural tissue which functions as a brain. Despite several conformational and anatomical irregularities, this brain hosts the majority of SCP-086's consciousness. SCP-0861 also contains an ear equivalent, tympanum, ossicles, etc., in the receiver's mouthpiece, allowing SCP-086 to hear. SCP-086 is able to speak in an exact match of Dr. Brown's voice and accent via the earpiece. Although radiological and ultrasound examination have not revealed any laryngeal structures, SCP-0861 is also capable of ringing. However, SCP-086 has stated that ringing gives it a headache. Consequently, the only circumstances under which it rings are when awakening from sleep, at which point it rings twice in rapid succession, and when in distress, at which point it rings SOS and Morse code. SCP-0862, 3, and 4 function as food intake organs. SCP-0862 consumes pencil shavings. SCP-0863 consumes staples. And SCP-0864 consumes microfilm. SCP-0865 functions as a combination bladder and bowel equivalent, storing metabolic wastes. SCP-0866 contains several organs, which appear to combine sensory and manipulatory functions. SCP-086 has proven capable of reading printed material and physically manipulating small items, for instance, turning pages and alphabetizing documents. When they are placed within SCP-0866, at SCP-086's request, it is regularly provided with non-classified reading material and non-classified clerical work. The biological functions of SCP-0867 and 8 have not been determined. However, SCP-086 has stated that it experiences significant discomfort and confusion when they are removed from its vicinity, and it is therefore speculated that they have some role in its cognition. Although SCP-0867 accepts input, its output seems to be random glyphs and LED noise. SCP-086 has demonstrated that it has full access to Dr. Brown's memories, and all tests indicate a 100% match with pre-existing psychological profiles of Dr. Brown. However, SCP-086 has pointed out that there is no way to confirm that it actually thinks of itself as Dr. Brown, and that it may be an alien intelligence, expertly posing as Dr. Brown, or a sleeper persona, which sincerely believes itself to be Dr. Brown. Acquisition Log SCP-086 is presumed to have been created on June 12, 1978, when Dr. Brown was presumed killed by the PN class events resulting from the decommissioning of SCP. On June 20, 1978, Dr. Brown's office was being emptied by maintenance personnel so that it could be assigned to his successor. At this point, SCP-0861 began ringing repeatedly, despite not being connected to a telephone jack. Maintenance personnel notified Level 3 operatives, who answered SCP-0861. During the subsequent conversation, SCP-086 identified itself as Dr. and then ordered Level 3 personnel to revoke its security clearance and to make a full report of its existence and properties to O5 level personnel. 
Dr. was given a posthumous commendation for meritorious conduct in either reporting himself as an SCP or in influencing the anomalous entity emulating his behavior into doing so. Note. SCP-086 was originally classified as safe, but it has stated that because it is a sapient entity with anomalous biology and metabolism, and with access to the full memories of an SCP Foundation Administrator, who previously had Level 4 security clearance, it should be classified as Euclid. Note, although we appreciate SCP-086's conscientiousness, there is at this time no pressing reason to classify it as Euclid. If circumstances change, We'll reconsider. 05 Item Number SCP-224 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Item SCP-224 is to be stored in a soundproof enclosure with acoustic destructive interference nodes. Nodes must be replaced on a weekly basis by remote means due to the erratic nature of SCP-224's effect. Non-Class D personnel are not to enter the enclosure. Additionally, SCP-224's enclosure must be kept free from moisture to avoid rapid oxidation. In the event that the clock begins to chime, all personnel must evacuate the area, and the location should be secured following Procedure Zite-77. Description SCP-224 is a wooden grandfather clock, accented with a black lacquer and gold leaf. Markings, remotely observed, date its origin at the end of the 19th century. Though internal examination of its components has been done, the density and construction of its gears make method of function impossible to interpret. The hands of the clock do not move with any known consistency, though the tendency seems to be generally clockwise. Additionally, chimes occur at non-regular intervals, ranging from approximately one minute to several months. To further complicate matters, the numbers on the clock also have a tendency to move and shift, though they generally retain ascending order. Each chime has an anomalous acoustic signature that causes a drastic localized temporal acceleration. People and objects in range of the sound begin to age. The amount of time is not consistent with the chimes, ranging from essentially inconsequential amounts to several years though the amount aged during any single event is consistent for all objects within the field of effect. SCP-224 was originally found in the antique shop and purchased by Mr. as a gift for his wife. When brought home and wound, the anomalous properties were noticed, though not acted upon, both apparently considering the object broken. Their bodies were discovered in their collapsed house two days later, aged significantly. Foundation personnel monitoring the house took interest, and SCP-224 was subsequently recovered. Foundation agents were unfortunately lost following exposure during transportation. Any instances of SCP-224 retaining any numeric pattern for an extended period should be reported to Dr. Locke. Failure to do so will result in suspension and possible demotion. Addendum SCP-224 Cataloged Incidents Due to repeated errors on the part of the maintenance crews working on containment for SCP-224, Dr. Simmons insisted that the following report be spread among the on-site work crews to fully stress the importance of SCP-224's containment. After its circulation, it was added to the primary case file for historical purposes. Today, I had the pleasure of informing Agent that he is to be given retirement pay and is free to leave active duty as of this evening. It was not initially approved by Director until I explained the circumstances. Agent who is the father of Alice and husband of Mary Lee, was walking past the SCP-224 containment facility on Friday, March 17, 1980. He was reporting to his supervisor's office to deliver the final report on SCP, which he was instrumental in helping acquire. Because SCP-224's effect is so unpredictable, he had no way of knowing that the object had activated until the acoustic dampening equipment failed, leading to the collapse of the wall. At this time, said agent was exposed to seven iterations of SCP-224's effect. The first one saw him age into his mid-thirties. Those of you who have seen the video are aware that this wasn't a drastic change. However, by the second exposure, he was now well into his forties. There was significant graying of hair, 
By the third iteration, he was balding, and we estimate his age reached into the early 60s. By the fourth, his skin had noticeably wrinkled, with liver spots appearing in several places. By the sixth iteration, Agent collapsed due to a broken hip, fracturing several ribs and his left arm. It was at this time that he lost control of his bowels and bladder. When the seventh iteration ended, containment had to be manually re-established. At this time, said agent is estimated to be over a hundred years old. As a note, Agent volunteered for termination and examination of SCP-224's effects should the retirement pay he was now technically entitled to be rewarded to his family. I heartily thank Director and said agent for giving us this opportunity to study SCP-224's effect. I hope you'll remember in the future that, while some SCPs kill immediately, others do not. Others leave lingering effects that have ramifications for the people and the families of the people who are subjected to them. Dr. Rasmussen was down the hall from Agent He is now a 35-year-old man in an elderly body. Assistant researcher Jessup, who was pregnant when she was exposed in the same incident, died when her child was forced through her abdomen. Her son is a 40-year-old man with the mind of an infant. Dr. Quinn's undiagnosed case of bladder cancer consumed his entire abdomen in a matter of moments. Please keep these incidents in mind before failing to replace the perfectly fine acoustic nodes in the containment enclosure. Dr. J. Simmons, Head of Containment, SCP-224 Item Number SCP-396 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures a geolocator has been affixed to SCP-396 to track its movements. Local Foundation liaisons have been dispatched to locations where SCP-396 frequently manifests to facilitate prompt recontainment. An airborne amnestic compound has been infused into the cushions of SCP-396 and into its containment chamber as a precaution. When possible, SCP-396 is to be contained within Area 93. Foundation personnel are not to mention any location or event taking place outside of Area 93 when they are within SCP-396's containment area. Failure to comply with this can result in demotion to level zero and is to be treated as a disclosure of classified information. Current theories on enacting permanent containment are currently focused on finding ways to utilize SCP-396's awareness of its surroundings to create controlled environments and induce it to teleport there, which SCP-396 may become settled in repeatedly appearing. This closed-loop theory of containment is currently under consideration by the Area 93 leadership. Description: SCP-396 is a chair constructed of plastic and steel. At statistically random intervals, usually between 1 and 11 months, SCP-396 will displace itself and another chair somewhere on the planet Earth. Any living matter that is seated on SCP-396 or the seat it is displacing will also change places. This change is instantaneous. The approximate limits of this teleportation are unclear, but SCP-396 is currently believed to be able to transport itself to any location on Earth. SCP-396 was discovered in a theater in Originally, it was classified as safe as its area of effect was believed to be localized. As such, junior-level researchers were frequently assigned to work with it. It is believed that SCP-396 is able to listen to nearby conversation and transported itself to locations mentioned by its research staff. Containment procedures and classification escalated until reaching their current levels. There are currently 1,046 locations that are known to have been discussed or mentioned in passing around SCP-396 that it may affect. It has been shown to be much more likely to affect locations that were mentioned repeatedly or in great detail. A full list is considered to be impossible due to incomplete records of SCP-396's early time in containment. Locations SCP-396 has affected Cruise Ship Located by junior researcher Bland while on vacation, after witnessing it manifest on the deck of the ship, Bland contacted the Foundation, and classification was upgraded to Euclid upon recontainment. 
theorized to have imprinted on Bland during his time working with the anomaly. Site 77, second level research floor. A researcher who had transferred from Site 77 is known to have mentioned their previous work there, which is the initial link leading to discovering the cause of SCP-396's escalation of anomalous activity. Death Row D-Class personnel assigned to testing had been asked to state their name and point of origin while in a testing chamber with SCP-396. D-936816 mentioned the data expunged, penitentiary at least two times during testing. Three months later, SCP-396 displaced itself in the electric chair located within this facility. Due to the fact that an execution was about to be performed prior to this displacement, it was only the timely intervention of local agents that prevented major amnestic intervention from becoming necessary. Upgrade to Keter put under consideration. Area 93 Washroom Review has shown that Researcher Park mentioned recent renovations to the Area 93 washroom when discussing their work environment with a colleague. Notably, this took place in a soundproof chamber, previously thought to be safe from SCP-396's anomalous effects. U.S. Supreme Court, Washington, D.C. Supreme Court Justice Abe Fortas's seat was replaced by SCP-396 after he had arrived within the building, but before taking his seat. It was not noticed until the end of that day's hearing, when Justice Fortas reported it as unusual to members of the Supreme Court police. Foundation personnel involved in the case were able to intercept documentation of the incident and recontain SCP-396. Set of talk show. A vacant audience member's chair was displaced during the live broadcast of the show, although its presence was not detected until after the show was over. Suppressed footage of the show shows that SCP-396 is clearly visible when the camera is pointed at the audience. This footage has since been replaced with a doctored copy in archives. Although recordings of the original broadcast have not been completely suppressed due to their widespread nature. Sheikra Roller Coaster, Orlando, Florida. SCP-396 manifested in an empty seat during the ride's normal operation. Agents were able to recontain SCP-396 within two hours of displacement, as the ride was shut down following the operators noticing the unusual seating and alerting their management. Agent Elaine was commended for also suppressing the souvenir photo taken on the ride. Vatican City Pope Paul VI was displaced, along with his throne, and appeared within Area 93, disoriented and confused. Light dosages of amnestics were able to convince His Holiness that the incident was a religious experience, and a deal was struck with Vatican City government officials to prevent widespread coverage of the incident. Addendum SCP-396-A On 9-18-19, during regular testing of SCP-1609, the anomaly unexpectedly began to show aggression towards D-939668. However, before any personnel could be injured or killed, SCP-1609 was displaced by SCP-396. Due to SCP-396's more remote location and secure containment chamber, there were no casualties, and SCP-1609 was recontained without additional incident. After the incident, it was found that D-939668 had previously worked as a contractor in the construction of multiple GOC facilities. Security data is being reviewed to find out how SCP-396 was able to displace itself to storage site 8. Item number SCP-432 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-432 is kept in a standard storage area at Sector 25, is to be kept locked at all times and the key to the lock kept in the adjacent security station, under guard by three Level 3 personnel. No other special containment required. Description SCP-432 is a two-door steel storage cabinet, measuring 2 meters tall by 1.2 meters wide by 1 meter deep. The exterior of the cabinet is painted matte green and bears no remarkable features except small areas of corrosion and light scratching commensurate with being left exposed to the elements for a long period of time. 
The doors of the cabinet are fitted with a basic slide bolt and a hasp for a padlock, allowing the door to be secured from outside. The interior dimensions of SCP-432 display significant disparity with the exterior. The doors open into an apparently extra-dimensional space, containing a large labyrinth complex comprised of an as-yet uncharted series of corridors. The walls, floor and ceiling of the corridors, are constructed from heavily rusted steel and adhere to the same height and width scales as the exterior of SCP-432, 2 meters high by 1.2 meters wide. The corridors within SCP-432 are lit at irregular intervals by what appear to be regular household light bulbs, secured to the walls and wire mesh fittings. Many of the bulbs are observed to flicker, and numerous others are burned out or broken. In places, several large-gauge steel pipes have been found bolted to the walls of the tunnels. These pipes are notably cold to the touch, and contain flowing water, although the source and destination of the pipes and water are unknown. Many of the pipes observed are in obvious need of repair, and leak cold, average of 3 degrees Celsius, water. Analysis of this water has revealed a low oxygen content and trace amounts of iron oxide, but the water is otherwise potable. The exact size of the labyrinth complex to which SCP-432 connects cannot be accurately measured, as each time the doors of the cabinet are closed and then reopened, the entrance created by the cabinet apparently moves to a different section of the maze. The fate of personnel within the maze when the door is closed is unknown, although remains discovered within the maze suggest starvation is a likely outcome. Other remains, coupled with additional evidence gathered during exploration, suggests that the labyrinth contains a large predatory inhabitant of indeterminate species, hereafter known as SCP-432-1. GPS units used within SCP-432 are rendered useless, as are cellular phones. Remote control devices sent into SCP-432 are similarly impaired and cease to function after traveling an average of 20 meters into the maze, rendering remote mapping of the internal layout impossible. High-gain radio transmissions can be used to keep in contact with the personnel within the labyrinth, although significant interference occurs deeper into the maze. If the doors of the cabinet are closed, then all forms of contact with personnel within SCP-432 are severed. Additional Notes SCP-432 was discovered in an abandoned industrial complex in UK. It came to the attention of the Foundation after Dr. T. Small heard reports of several homeless persons in the area disappearing after staying in the complex. Upon investigation, Dr. Small discovered the cabinet at the center of an abandoned steel mill, surrounded by a number of sleeping bags, bags of clothing, and other personal effects, suggesting a number of homeless persons had recently made camp there. SCP-432 was unlocked, but the door closed upon discovery. After exploring the immediate area beyond the entrance, Dr. Small exited SCP-432 and summoned Foundation personnel to transport the cabinet to Sector 25 for analysis. Currently, expeditions have been sent into SCP-432 to attempt to chart its internal geography. To date, several D-Class personnel have been lost within the maze. No further expeditions may be made without express permission of at least two Level 4 personnel. Paint samples, metal fatigue, and construction techniques date SCP-432 to having been constructed in the early 1950s. However, artifacts recovered from within SCP-432 have been accurately dated to much earlier periods. Expeditions Below are the expeditions within SCP-432 to date. The Standard Agreed Mission Equipment Pack agreed by Dr. T. Small and Dr. is one hand torch, flashlight, with a three-hour lifespan, and additional power sources providing up to six additional hours, one headset microphone linked to control, one shoulder-mounted video unit set for wireless transmission, two 0.5-liter bottles of water, 
two high-calorie energy bars, eight sticks of luminous marker chalk, SCP-432 Expedition 1, date, expunged, expedition supervisor, Dr. T.S., subject is D-64502, male, average physique, subject's background shows history of aggravated assault and burglary. Subject is equipped with standard mission equipment pack and sent into SCP-432. Camera is activated, and subject enters SCP-432. The door is held open by a 3 kilogram weight placed inside the doorway, with technicians on hand to remove the weight and close the door, if required. Camera activates, showing a short corridor constructed from the same rusted, corroded metal as the exterior of SCP-432. The floor is formed from ridged safety steel, as might be found on industrial walkways or gantries. The corridor makes a 90 degree turn to the right, approximately 5 meters ahead of the subject. Control asks the subject to move around the corner. Subject moves forward as requested, turning the corner into a longer tunnel, the exact length of which cannot be judged due to lack of lighting. A conventional electric bulb on the wall lights the immediate area, but the light fails to illuminate much beyond three meters. Further lights can be observed ahead, though they only illuminate patches of the tunnel. Control instructs the subject to turn on his torch, and the lighting is notably improved to the limit of the torch's beam. Approximately 20 meters. Control asks the subject to proceed down the tunnel. After approximately 42 meters, a crossroads appears in the tunnel. D-64502 asks Control which way to go, and Control tells the subject to pick a tunnel. The subject chooses to go left and, before entering the new tunnel, produces a stick of marker chalk from the equipment pack and draws a large arrow on the wall, indicating the direction of the exit. As subject moves into new tunnel, Control notes that video quality has begun to degrade with visible interference appearing on the monitors. Control does not inform the subject of this. Subject proceeds down new tunnel for 11 meters before tunnel T-junctions left and right. Subject takes the left tunnel, again marking the direction back to the exit with chalk, and continues onwards. Subject walks approximately 5 meters down the tunnel then stops, and asks Control if they heard anything. Control replies they did not and asks what D-64502 heard. Subject is quiet, as if listening, then replies in muted tones that he can hear someone banging on the wall in the distance and shouting. Subject becomes agitated and tells Control the person sounds f***ing scared. Control boosts audio gain on the subject's camera and pick up sounds similar to the subject's description. Repetitive distant banging consistent with someone striking a metal surface with their arm or hand. A voice can be detected, but audio quality is not sufficient to discern words. Subject is becoming increasingly agitated by the sounds. Control informs the subject to move in the direction of the shouts. The subject objects, but after a short discussion with Control about the nature of his employment, he moves forward. After approximately 14 meters, the tunnel turns 90 degrees right and angles downwards in a gentle slope. Video interference is now noticeably increased, and slight audio interference is now audible. Subject has begun breathing heavily and muttering under his breath. Subject continues down the tunnel for approximately 27 meters until the floor levels out again. The subject abruptly stops, crouches, and swears. Control asks why he has stopped. The subject remains silent, but breathing has become louder and heavier. Control asks again why the subject has stopped, and D-64502 replies he heard a scream and that the banging and shouting has suddenly stopped. Control informs the subject to stand and move forward, but the subject becomes agitated and demands to be allowed to leave. After several minutes of arguing, the subject stands, takes a long drink from one of the bottles of water, and moves forward again, although slowly. 
Ahead, the tunnel T-junctions left and right, and Control tells the subject to go right. Subject marks the way back to the exit with chalk, and goes right. The tunnel ends in a dead end after six meters. Control informs the subject to go back to the junction and take the left tunnel. This too ends in a dead end after only four meters. Subject seems to have calmed slightly and suggests returning to the previous T-junction and trying the other tunnel. Control confers with Dr. who decides to recall the subject and analyze the data collected so far. The subject has been within SCP-432 for exactly 37 minutes at this point. Control informs the subject to return. The subject moves back through the tunnels, following his chalk marks towards the exit. At crossroads, the subject freezes again and asks Control if they heard a noise. Control confirms that they are detecting a sound, but requests D-64502 explain what he is hearing. Subject identifies the noise as wind. At this point, the camera captures a small drift of what appears to be dead leaves blown from the right-hand unexplored tunnel. Subject remarks that the breeze smells stale. Control informs the subject to collect several leaves for analysis, and then proceed down the right-hand tunnel to locate their source. Subject collects leaves and complains about orders to remain in SCP-432 but moves towards the tunnel mouth. As subject nears the tunnel entrance, a loud echoing roar is heard over the audio, similar to a large animal such as a bear or lion. Subject panics, screams, and runs for the exit, ignoring Control's demands to investigate the sound. Subject sprints to the exit and collapses in the storage area. Expedition is aborted, the door closed and locked and subject removed for debriefing. SCP-432 Expedition 2 Date Expunged Expedition Supervisor Dr. T.S. Subject is D-6411, female, 32, average physique. Subject's background shows an incident of attempted murder. Subject is equipped with standard mission equipment pack and sent into SCP-432. Camera is activated, and subject enters SCP-432. The door is held open by a 3 kilogram weight placed inside the doorway, with technicians on hand to remove the weight and close the door if required. Camera activates, showing subject is in a long corridor constructed from the same corroded metal as the exterior of SCP-432. Light from the open door behind the subject coupled with the illumination provided by the bulbs located at irregular intervals on the walls of the structure, lights the tunnel for approximately 20 meters. More lights are visible further down the tunnel, but are very dim. Control requests Subject turn on her torch and move into the structure. Subject complies. The passage continues for approximately 100 meters from the entrance until it ends in a T-junction, leading left and right. Subject asks Control which way to go and is told to go right. D-6411 marks the route back to the exit with marker chalk and proceeds down the tunnel for 50 meters until a crossroads is reached. Control informs subject to take the left-hand branch, and subject marks the tunnel wall and enters the indicated passageway, which is followed for 47 meters until another crossroads is reached. Control notes interference to both the video and audio feeds has begun to appear but is currently negligible. Subject pauses to drink from one of her bottles of water and marks her route back before selecting, without permission from Control, the right-hand branch. Control admonishes D-6411, but allows her to continue. The passageway makes a 90-degree turn left after 18 meters, then continues straight for approximately 73 meters. Ahead of the subject appears another crossroads. But as the subject nears it, she freezes and reports that she can hear a rhythmic banging coming through the walls. Control boosts audio gain on camera, and the sound is picked up. The banging lasts for 73 seconds before it stops. Subject has remained still while listening, attempting to breathe quietly. Control prompts the subject to mark the tunnel wall and proceed left. The subject remains motionless 
and makes several inquiries into the nature of SCP-432 and the source of the banging. Control firmly reiterates their commands, and Subject resumes walking, taking the left tunnel as indicated. Subject has traveled for almost 150 meters when she stops and aims the camera at the left wall of the tunnel. She observes that all of the light fittings in this stretch of the structure have been broken. Shards of broken bulb are visible scattered across the floor. Subject continues forward, remarking that she has begun to detect a faint, unpleasant odor. When asked to describe said odor, D-6411 replies, Something dead. After a further 24 meters, the subject notices an object in the tunnel ahead and moves towards it. Video quality is now beginning to severely degrade. Camera angle tilts as subject kneels to examine the object, and Control asks subject to explain what she has found. Subject explains the object is a left sports shoe. The camera zooms in on the object, while the subject illuminates it with her light source. Camera view tilts again as subject suddenly looks down at the floor of the tunnel and emits a loud expletive. The floor of the tunnel is covered with a large quantity of dried brown residue that crackles and flakes as the subject moves her feet. Sprays of the residue are observed dried onto the walls. The subject remarks that the substance is apparently the source of the odor, and she surmises it is dried blood. The camera tracks several large smears of the substance leading away from the pool up the corridor. Subject's breathing is becoming slightly panicked. Control requests the subject collect the shoe and a sample of the substance for analysis. Subject does so, although complains continuously about the smell and expresses wishes to exit SCP-432. Her requests are denied, and Control orders the subject to continue onwards. Subject continues down the corridor at a much decreased walking speed and is becoming agitated. Camera view changes repeatedly as Subject begins looking over her shoulder at erratic intervals. Video and audio feed are beginning to become severe, and Control asks Subject to halt while they confer with Dr. Dr. decides to recall the Subject, who is now becoming extremely panicked, complaining of hearing footsteps behind the wall to her right. Control boosts audio, but interference prevents confirmation of Subject observations. Dr. confirms the expedition is over, and Control recalls the subject, who begins moving back towards the exit at increasing speed. Subject's egress from SCP-432 is unremarkable, except for Subject's increasing speed as she nears the exit. Once out of SCP-432, the door is closed and locked, and Subject sent for debrief. SCP-432 Expedition 3 File locked. SCP-432 Expedition 4 Date Expunged Expedition Supervisor Dr. T.S. Team is made up of three members. D-5891, Male 27, D-8321, Female 32, and Technical Assistant K. Equipment pack for this expedition differs from norm. Each member carries one hand torch with a three-hour lifespan and additional power sources providing up to six additional hours, one headset microphone linked to control, two 0.5-liter bottles of water, two high-calorie energy bars. Subject D-5891 is equipped with ten sticks of luminous marker chalk, one 250-millimeter steel pry bar, Subject D-8321 is equipped with one shoulder-mounted video unit set for wireless transmission. Technical Assistant K is equipped with one standard-issue Beretta 9mm firearm with 20 rounds of ammunition, one back-mounted oxyacetylene cutting torch. Subjects have been briefed that they are to enter SCP-432, move a short distance into the structure, and then attempt to cut through the interior walls with the oxyacetylene torch. Camera is activated, and team enters SCP-432. The door is held open by a 3-kilogram weight placed inside the doorway, 
with technicians on hand to remove the weight and close the door if required. Camera activates, showing team is in a long corridor constructed from the same corroded metal as the exterior of SCP-432. Light from the team's torches illuminates the tunnel for approximately 30 meters. The team moves into the structure, with D-5891 marking their progress every few meters with luminous chalk. After several turnings, chosen by control at random, the team arrives at a crossroads. Attached to the wall of the northern passageway are two large steel pipes. The team is asked by control to examine these pipes. K places a hand on one pipe and remarks that it is very cold to the touch and that there is a sensation of liquid moving within the pipe. K requests to cut into the pipe, but Control denies the request, directing the team to follow the pipes instead. Team moves north from the crossroads, following the pipes for almost 300 meters, taking several turnings in the process until the pipes continue through the wall of a dead end. Control informs the team that they should ignite the oxyacetylene torch and cut through the dead end. At this point, K moves to the fore and lights the torch. D-5891 takes up position behind him with the pry bar ready, and D-8321 moves back to cover the other two with the camera. K cuts into the wall, attempting to excise a hole large enough to step through. As he begins cutting, D-8321 remarks that she believes she heard a noise behind them. The camera angle changes as she looks over her shoulder, revealing the corridor behind the team to be empty. Control requests she turn back and film the cutting. K has made an approximately one meter high cut into the wall when D-8321 remarks again that she can hear something moving close by and begins looking around. D-5891 and K appear not to hear her over the sound of the oxyacetylene torch. K finishes the vertical cut and then proceeds to make a short horizontal cut to allow D-5891 to insert the pry bar and pull out a section of the metal wall. As D-5891 steps forward and inserts the pry bar into the cut, a loud roar is heard, apparently coming from behind the wall. D-8321 screams and begins to back away, at which point, the cut section of wall is seen to bend outwards, pushed by something from behind. At this point, the video feed becomes confused, as D-8321 attempts to flee, and the camera is unable to compensate for her rapid movements. Audio transmission is unreliable, due to the interference and screams of the team. It appears that a large indigenous life form came through the hole cut out by K and assaults the team. Gunfire can be heard, presumably from K's sidearm, along with screams from D-8321 and D-5891. The audio logs also record a loud bellowing, which is currently unidentified, but presumed to be made by the life form. Video stills reveal that data expunged. Subject D-8321 manages to return to the entrance of SCP-432, injured and in a state of extreme mental distress. She exits SCP-432 and, before technical staff can stop her, pulls out the weight holding the door open and shuts SCP-432. When the door is reopened, the internal layout has changed, and D-5891 and technical assistant K are assumed lost. Subject D-8321 is removed for debrief, after which she is terminated. During debrief, it is discovered that a large tuft of animal hair is caught in the harness of D-8321's equipment pack. The hair is removed for analysis. SCP-432 Expedition 5 Date Expunged Expedition Supervisor Dr. T.S. Subject is D-8887, male, 19, athletic physique. Subject's background shows a history of gang violence and murder. Subject is equipped with standard mission equipment pack and sent into SCP-432. Camera is activated and subject enters SCP-432. The door is held open by a 3 kilogram weight placed inside the doorway, with technicians on hand to remove the weight and close the door if required. 
Camera activates. Showing subject is in a short corridor, constructed from the same corroded metal as the exterior of SCP-432, which terminates in a T-junction after approximately 10 meters. Tunnel is notable to previous expeditions in that there are no lit bulbs on the walls. As subject moves forward, he remarks that there is a large quantity of broken glass on the floor of the tunnel. Subject switches on his torch and proceeds forward to T-junction, then proceeds left as instructed by control after marking his route. Subject moves through SCP-432, taking turns as indicated by control. During this time, the subject is careful to mark his route using marker chalk and makes routine reports to control, describing any visual or audio impressions of the structure. Subject reports that he can hear occasional, distant machine noises through the walls, and that the interior of SCP-432 is quite cold. After 45 minutes, subject has traveled approximately 2,500 meters through the structure. Video and audio interference is minimal, and subject has carefully marked his route through SCP-432 with marker chalk. So far, all the wall-mounted light bulbs observed in this section of the structure have been broken. Subject stops to take a drink from a bottle of water and consume a ration bar. After resting for a few minutes, subject continues and, after taking a turning to the right, encounters three objects on the floor of the tunnel. Subject stops and illuminates the objects with his torch, revealing them to be two crumpled food cans and one bent tin fork. The cans are partially corroded and seem to be quite old. The labels are of a familiar brand of canned beans. Control asks the subject to place the items in his equipment pack for analysis. Subject continues onwards, but after 40 meters stops and informs Control he can hear something. Control requests clarification, and D-8887 remarks that he can hear a faint sobbing or crying emanating from somewhere nearby. Control asks if the crying is male or female, and subject responds that it sounds male. Audio pickup fails to register the sound clearly. Subject is currently stood at a T-junction, and Control instructs D-8887 to move in the direction of the crying. Subject takes the left-hand passageway, moves 30 meters down the connected corridor, takes a right turn, and follows the corridor another 22 meters, proceeds straight ahead at a crossroads, and continues for 37 meters. Video interference has begun to increase, and control cautions the subject not to proceed too quickly. Subject complains the darkness within SCP-432 is hampering his efforts, then shouts, Hello! Can you hear me? I'm coming! Control admonishes D-8887 for shouting, informing him he may attract attention to himself. Subject asks, What else is in here then? But Control informs the subject to continue along his current route and locate the source of the crying. Subject stops at the next junction and pauses to listen. Audio picks up a drawn-out moan or scream apparently human in origin, after which the crying ceases. Subject swears and asks if they heard the scream, stating it sounded very close. Control asks Subject to proceed forward, and Subject complies although slowly, attempting to move with as much stealth as possible. After 20 meters, the passageway turns right. Subject moves around the corner cautiously, the camera reveals the passageway ends in a dead end. Subject approaches the wall and places an ear against the metal. Subject backs away from the wall hurriedly, hissing expletives. Control asks what he heard, and Subject whispers, There's something behind the wall. I can hear it crunching on something. Subject makes repeated whispered requests to exit SCP-432 immediately. Control confers with Dr. S who agrees to recover the subject. Control confirms the subject may begin retracting his route, which he does so at an increased pace. Subject's egress from the structure is uneventful, although subject keeps looking over his shoulder and requires repeated verbal encouragement from Control to prevent the onset of panic. Subject returns from SCP-432 after a total expedition time 
of 1 hour and 47 minutes and is sent for debriefing. SCP-432 materials recovered. All documents contained in this file are Class II clearance, requiring two signed approvals to access. All of the following items have been recovered from within SCP-432 during the expeditions to date. Leaves Discovered on Expedition 1 12 leaves in total 3 oak 4 ash 2 rowan and 3 maple leaves All leaves are dry and crumbling and exhibit signs of extreme age. Footwear Recovered on Expedition 2 A single left sports shoe made from rubber and canvas with the logo on the ankle. The branding and manufacturing style dates the shoe to 1982. The shoe shows signs of heavy use, frayed laces, worn soles and scuffed toes, and is caked in a fine layer of earth and rust. Dried blood. Recovered on Expedition 2. Scrapings from a large dried blood stain. Tests have confirmed the blood is human, male, type O positive. The blood is too old and degraded for DNA reconstruction. Animal hair. Recovered on Expedition 4. A large tuft of matted brown animal fur with a large clump of skin cells attached to the roots. The hairs are approximately 13 centimeters long, stiff and coarse, and smell extremely unpleasant. DNA analysis has placed the creature in the order family, although noticeable irregularities in the DNA profile exist, suggesting data expunged. Food tins and fork. Recovered on Expedition 5. Two crushed and empty cans of baked beans with meatballs and one tin fork. The cans have apparently been opened with a church key type can opener, and the contents consumed. Dried residue confirms the contents of the cans to have been baked beans with meatballs. One can contains traces of human blood mixed with a food sauce, as well as small traces of human tissue. The blood and tissue is mixed with the food sauce in a manner to suggest it was added to the food prior to consumption. The fork is stamped from tin and of a manufacture and style consistent with 1940s army issue mess kits. It is bent and scratched in places as commensurate with extended use. The tines of the fork are covered with dried food sauce, consistent with baked beans with meatballs, as well as traces of human blood and tissue. Item Number SCP-434 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-434 is to be stored in a secured vault when not in use. SCP-434 is not to be utilized by individuals with a history of violent psychological issues or by humanoid SCPs. All individuals utilizing or assembling SCP-434 are to have all weapons removed from their persons. A full security team is to be on standby during all uses of SCP-434, and all observations by psychological personnel are to be conducted from an isolated location. Description: SCP-434 is an antique conference table. SCP-434 will not function unless at least eight chairs are placed around it. When a subject sits at SCP-434, Physical duplicates of the subject will appear in seven of the other chairs. These individuals, referred to as SCP-434-1 to SCP-434-7, possess all of the subject's memories and knowledge, but seemingly only a fragment of their personality. SCP-434-1-7 through are aware of their temporary nature and rarely react negatively to it. When questioned on the issue, they will state that they are elements of the subject and will live in him for all his life. The individuals remain for a full day after the subject leaves the table, after which they vanish, leaving no detectable traces. However, the individuals are more than capable of assaulting each other, other personnel, and in rare cases, typically where the subject is mentally unstable, the subject themselves. While injuries have no lasting effect, the death of an individual results in a marked change in the personality of the subject, 
corresponding to the lack of the aspect embodied by that individual. SCP-434-1-7 through are as follows. SCP-434-1 will not tolerate criticism and will not accept the subject has ever been at fault. SCP-434-1 will always ignore evidence to the contrary. Conversation will focus on the positive aspects of the subject. The loss of SCP-434-1 results in a crippling loss of self-confidence and self-esteem. SCP-434-2 will act and advise the subject for their own benefit, regardless of the requirements or well-being of others. The loss of SCP-434-2 will cause the subject to consistently fail to consider their own needs in decision-making, to a point that is often eventually fatal. SCP-434-3 rarely speaks, and does so only to counsel the avoidance of activities or effort on the subject's behalf. The loss of SCP-434-3 results in the subject apparently losing the ability to sleep, without chemical assistance, and a deep-seated reluctance to take rest of any kind. SCP-434-4 will often fixate on a specific object or quality possessed by an individual known to the subject, and advise its acquisition. SCP-434-4 will also react negatively to all individuals who are not the subject. The loss of SCP-434-4 results in the subject losing the capacity to identify objects as theirs, and, over an extended period, gradually erodes their sense of self. SCP-434-5 will advise the subject to explore their whims and desires, regardless of practicality or the presence of other requirements. The loss of SCP-434-5 results in the subject no longer being able to experience enjoyment in any form of activity, with the expected associated physiological damage. SCP-434-6 will advise aggression, active or passive, to counter all difficulties suffered by the subject. SCP-434-6 is the most likely to be violent. The loss of SCP-434-6 results in the subject becoming almost entirely passive and avoiding conflict of any kind. Subjects lacking SCP-434-6 will not engage in violence of any kind, regardless of the situation. SCP-434-7 will advise the subject to what the subject believes to be their best long-term gain, regardless of the needs of others. The loss of SCP-434-7 will result in a crippling degradation of the subject's long-term planning and decision-making capabilities. SCP-434 was first brought to the attention of the Foundation by a member of the Order of Saint an organization that has had extensive historical contact with SCPs. SCP-434 was reported to be stored in a vault in the Vatican. However, when a Foundation recovery team was dispatched, the vault was found empty. Forensic analysis of the vault indicated recent weapons fire and blood traces. In 19, the Foundation was made aware of a break-in at House, an MCD holding. Examination of police reports allowed the Foundation to locate SCP-434 before it was recovered by MCD. Carbon dating of the wood from which SCP-434 is constructed indicates that it is approximately 3,000 years old. The theory currently held by Foundation researchers is that SCP-434 was built from material salvaged from a much older SCP. SCP-434 has proven a useful tool in both personnel evaluation and non-standard interrogation. Its use to alter the behaviors of troublesome subjects is pending approval. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.